Hi everyone, Joe for jazbeescasebreaks.com coming at you with a full case of 2023 Bowman Baseball. This is Jumbo Edition, random player break number one. One spot gets you four comboed up players. All right, so there are the players plus combos right here. So it's a, it's a giant list, right? But includes all, all of the players on the checklist. Now, if you bought one of the first 28 spots in the break, you got a chance to win an extra spot. That's our first dice roll. Second dice roll will be uh, your names and player names, and we'll have a we'll have a uh, trade window as well. So big thanks to the first 28 right there for getting in on it. Thanks to the other others who bought spots straight up. Congrats to the people who won spots right there for a total of 43 spots. So let's do this dice roll first. So name on top, after six, we'll get an extra spot. Five and a one. One, two, three, four, five, and a one. Six and final time. Jeremy Short, there you go. JS, after six, with an extra spot going your way. So thanks for being an early bird. So there's an extra spot now. Let me multiply these 43 spots by four. So there's one already. There's two, three, and four. So that's 172 total. So now let's get everybody's names here. Put them into a clean list. And let's gather all the players. and put them into this other list. And we'll put the results of that in the first tab. Now, let's randomize names and players three and a two, five times. One, two, three, four, and five. Got Jacob down to Jacob. Three and a two, five times for the players. One, two, three, four, and five. So after five, we got Angel Janel down to the Luis Ravello combo. These are way too many names for me to read out, but I'll show you the list as is. And then I'll alphabetize by your first name so you can see uh, all of your players grouped together. But I just want to show you the list as is just for the video. Just have that on wax. There's your entire list right there. Great. So look at that. Matthew Nielsen with the Drew Jones spot. Very nice, Matthew. Good luck. So let's sort now by column A. And then you can see all of your players grouped together. Aaron, Barry, Brad, Brian, Craig, Darren, David, David M, Ed P, Eric Houston, I think Eric was here earlier with the spot that you won. Got that Spencer Jones spot. Gabe P, Jacob, Jason, Jason Cox, Jason Fractor, two different Jasons. Then Jay, Jeremy in your early bird spots. Jim Way, Jose with the spot that you won, and your last spot mojo. Got Mark, got Matt, there's Matthew Nielsen, there's that Drew Jones spot right there. Michael, and one of my favorite beers, Pacifico. Mickey, Neil, 
Nicole. Oliver with the spot that you won. Got Mr. Rob Hepler here, the Hepcat. Robert. Ryan. Scotty. Scott G. Steven. And last but not least, Tristan. There you go. We're going to pause the video. We're going to open up the trade window. When we come back, we'll see if there's any trades. Then we'll have the break. Stick around. Be right back. All right, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. No deals were done, so the list that you saw remains the same. Now, for those of you watching live, I've shared the link to this spreadsheet in the, uh, in the chat. So you'll be able to go directly to this list and just keep track of your players right there. I know we I just want to put the final printout on wax, on, this, uh, on tape, on the record, on video, as they say. And there's everybody right here. All right. Now let's pop open this case. And let's, let's see what we got. Random player break. Yeah, let's have some fun, Mick. Let's see what we got in here. Oh, what happened here? Oh, did I hit it with the case, maybe? There we go. And here we go. What's up, Rex? Did I hear, I did not see your question about Ken Golden? There's a Ken Golden Netflix show? That's right, Joe Pizzle. Little random player break with some Bowman. Yeah, you missed it. It's been here, it's been, we've, been, we've offered that since Last Wednesday, I want to say, whatever the new release day of this was, last Wednesday, it was on the site. Was the LeBron logo man the one I pulled? No? Well, I pulled the one that was from like 2019, 2020 Immaculate Basketball. Logo man only. And I don't think we, I don't think that was sold through Golden, so I don't think they're gonna highlight that one. I think it went through Leland instead. What's the Ken Golden thing on Netflix? What's that about? All right, so first off, all cards ship except for these vet commons, unless they're numbered, obviously. All right, rookie cards will ship. There may be some, obviously this is gonna ship Juan Soto to 299. Now there may be, obviously that's gonna ship, but like prospect non-first won't ship either. So who's the Spencer Jones is a key player. Who's got Spencer Jones? That's going to be for Eric Houston with the Spencer Jones. It's supposedly a card and memorabilia show. 
both produced it. All right, our first autograph is Caden Dana. Caden Dana is going to go to Jose with the Caden Dana and Kodai Senya spot. Is that, what, is that what Teddy said, Eric, that he was cramping up? He's standing. A little bit healthier for him. Oh, Cam Collier is the guy that we're looking out for as well. That's going to be for the for Jose as well. Has the Cam Collier Eric Brown Jr. combo. I think Manning should have a sketch comedy show. Oh, well, yeah, maybe. I think they're doing fine with all that advertising money they're getting. I don't think they need to do a sketch comedy show. It's a hassle. You gotta find writers, you gotta find, you know, doing all that. I think they'd rather just get paid by ESPN just to go around and do goofy stuff. I mean, that's a sketch comedy show in and of itself. There's Jet Williams to 399. I think if you watch like Peyton's places on ESPN and Eli's places, those are pretty. Those are pretty hilarious. Those are pretty funny. I think that's where they, that's where they shine, and they bring out athletes to host. I think we're already getting that Rex on ESPN Plus. And I think they, they get so much money for the advertising they do. <laughs> I mean, I think they're, they're kind of at a position where, where they can do sketch comedy recs in ads where they're getting paid tons of money, much more than they would ever get for doing their own sketch card show. Sketch, sketch card? Sketch comedy show. So I think they've gotten to that unique sort of, sort of level. Here is Tommy Specht. Who do I got for the tomorrow night for the Suns or Nuggets? Uh, Suns. Ryan Gamsby has Tommy Specht. I do. I mean, Suns are too good. Joe, I know the I know the Nuggets are good, but I think that's that's got to be a seven game series. You know, you don't think you don't think the Suns can make the, they're definitely gonna make the adjustments. You know who's gonna have to step up? DeAndre Ayton's gonna have to step up. You know they're telling him, big man, you got to go to work. You got to put a body on that on Jokic. You know, like, listen, Durant, Devin Booker, they're going to shoot the lights out. But someone's got to slow, but they can't slow down. You know, they can't slow down Jokic. You know, I mean, we're doing our best to stop Jamal Murray. <laughs> so they've, they've, they'll, they'll adjust, they'll adjust. They'll adjust. I 
I have one more autograph out of here, right? I only have two. I should have three. No? Hmm. All right. On average, that's how they get you. All right, next box. Right. Also, you got to think, Jamal Murray couldn't miss last night. That is correct. What did he... Pull up these stand. Now it's a little cold. I mean, what did what did he shoot yesterday? I mean, Jamal Murray went thirteen for twenty four from the field. What is that? Six of ten from three. He's shooting sixty percent from three. Like, do you think that's going to happen again? If it does, I mean, that's that's on the Suns at this point. Game one, sure. You know, you could be like, all right, that's what they're going to do, huh? You know, Suns will adjust. Problem is, Suns did kind of... That's going to happen here and there, I feel like. The Suns, for Durant, traded a lot of a lot of that defensive depth away. But DeAndre Aiden cannot have a plus-minus of minus 21 pivotal. He's got a, He's got. He's the only one that could that could put it, put a body on Jokic, and he's got a score over Jokic too. Fourteen points, seven rebounds. That's not enough. Zero zero blocks. Tom is asking if I, did I buy Contenders Optic Figure Dean 4? No, I did not. That sold out though. We did that break already. Take a look at the schedule. You'll see when we did it. Take a look at our video list. I see it uploaded already. Remember ladies and gentlemen, the schedule will tell you everything we've done previously for the day, what we're doing currently, and what we're going to do later on. So you're never in the dark. All right, that's going to be tricky. Doubling Jokic is rough because the Nuggets, they're full of shooters. Right, there is Purple Chrome, Shea Whitcomb. Astros prospect going to... That'll be for Matthew Nielsen with the Whitcomb Jr. plus Ronald Acuna Jr. combo. Another Spencer Jones Bowman first. Spencer Jones Chrome. And a green paper to three ninety nine Colby Thomas. Colby Thomas.
Joe Pizzle and other basketball fans like, like Scott maybe. Who do you have in uh, Lakers Warriors? The Lakers may have a bit of a size advantage on the Warriors, and I think that's going to be helpful. That's got that's got to be six or seven games. Oh, and a Spencer Jones Chrome Prospect autograph redemption. That's Eric Houston, I believe. Spencer Jones, Eric Houston, with the spot that you won. Nice. There you go, Eric. You're welcome, man. Thanks for getting that filler. Thanks for giving that a shot. I know I tell everybody, listen, don't do the fillers. They're a waste of money. Buy your team straight up. Buy your spot straight up. But stuff like this happens, and I can see why the, the fillers can be attractive. Rex is Rex. I can't believe you won't ask me my predictions for that game. Rex, I I I wouldn't ask you for predictions on most things. Definitely not basketball. We got yellow paper. Von Grissom to seventy-five. All right, well, you know what, Rex? Let's give you a fair shake. Rex, what do you think? Who do you have in the Lakers-Warriors series? How many games do you think it's going to go? What do you think are a couple keys to the games that'll, that'll, that'll you know, mean success for, uh, for, for each team? What does each team have to do to win that series? Let's hear it. And our third auto is Yoangel Aponte, 96 out of 499. And that will be for Ed P. You have the Yoangel, Seiya Suzuki, and Matt Olson combo. Four two Lakers, I'll take that. Lakers are too hot. G Lo saying LeBron th thrives on bear pokers. And the Warriors don't got that unless Draymond slips up. There's a good chance Draymond could slip up. <laughs> Oliver has dubs in five. Honestly, if I had to go, you'd have to say Warriors and because of Curry. Lakers like to choke. 4-3 Warriors. Yeah, they showed how much they choke in that Grizzly series, Rex. They showed how much they choked down the stretch when they were one of the hottest teams in basketball. This is why we don't ask Rex his predictions. <laughs> and Rex is probably just parroting what, uh, what Joe Pizzle is saying about basketball. I got a Randy De Jesus to 125. 
Warriors in seven. This is Joe Pizzle. Now the problem with the... Yeah, the Lakers do have a size advantage, but... But the, uh, but the Warriors, good perimeter shooters, obviously. <laughs> what is the understatement? But they've got great perimeter shooting. That's something the Lakers still have some trouble defending. So if the Warriors start shooting threes at will, which pulls AD away from the paint and defending the perimeter, then that's a lot of Steph Curry flying by Anthony Davis and breaking down defenses. So that's going to be a challenge for them for sure. But yeah, I mean the key is always is always Anthony Davis. As always. Although, I will say that if, if this is a big if, I don't, what are the playoff odds now? Well, those odds must be out. Uh, if the Lakers beat the Warriors, then I think they're going to the finals. If the Lakers beat the Warriors, then I think that means they're going to the finals. If that's a good question, all we're saying if Steph beats LeBron again, does Steph get into the goat conversation? I mean, if the Warriors knock out another championship, then absolutely. LeBron, Kevin Durant, Western Conference Final? Absolutely. I would love to see that. There's Josh Hood to 499. That will be for, that's going to go to Ed P, who has the Josh Hood Otani combo. I don't know if there's too many Otanis in here, but there could be some numbered cards of Otani or something like that. He's on the checklist. But I think we got we have some just kind of putting our fan biases aside. I think we've got a pretty good pretty good set of playoff teams here, some playoff matchups to watch. I mean what's the what's the worst matchup we have? You know, like Sixers Celtics are gonna be fun to watch. Phoenix Denver is gonna be fun to watch. Lakers Warriors gonna be I guess Miami Knicks? That's and that's still a good series too. Is that the worst series? Not a fan of the Knicks as area. Yeah, Knicks Heat, Oliver saying. There's a Marion Boyd, it's 250, purple chrome. You know, and I still think I still think that's going to be a good series too. I mean, I still I'd, I'd still watch it. 
what's the ideal final four? What's the ideal Eastern Conference final matchup and Western Conference final matchup? I'm sure the NBA and the TV networks would love to have seen Warriors, Lakers in the Western Conference final, but I, I think that's it's already happening. Obviously, it's happening now. But Warriors, Suns. Yeah, no offense to Denver, but yeah, I don't know if I think. The matchup with the most ratings. Yeah, Warriors Suns has got to be to 150. Julio Rodriguez, blue paper. And we've got Pedro Ramirez. Yeah, I think the I think LeBron and and the Suns would be pretty good too, but not as good as Warriors Suns because I think. Um, you know, the KD storyline, obviously. Uh, Pedro Ramirez. That will be for Stephen Carney, who has the Pedro Ramirez-Gavin Williams combo. Yeah, for the, the Kevin Durant Golden State Warriors storyline, I think will be great. Can you imagine uh, the words that Draymond will have for KD during the series? I think that's going to be a lot. That would be a lot of fun. In the East, what do you think? All of are saying Knicks and Celtics. Yeah, I think that might be the best. Got a big market team in the Knicks and the and the Celtics. And definitely want to knock out a championship with that squad. Kyle Harrison to 499. And then what would be the best finals matchup of those final four teams, Oliver? If you got Warriors, Suns, Boston, Knicks, you want. I mean, TV probably wants Warriors, right? Or no, is there, has there been too much Warriors oversaturation? But maybe you need like a villain. Everyone's rooting against the Warriors because you've seen them so much. And people will tune in. And we got a Ryan Clifford, the big red dog. Ryan Clifford is going to go to Jason Fractor as the Ryan Clifford O'Neill Cruz combo. Randall's a mess. Or maybe he burned me on a parlay, says Eric Houston. Scott says, I do not include Randall on parlays anymore. Lesson learned. Here's our first Drew Jones. Script writers, Gilo saying, might have LeBron back this year. Yeah, that's pretty. There's Miguel Blease to 299. Oh shoot, this is almost over already. Less than 50 seconds left. Colorado down by one, empty net. Seattle could move on to the next round. Hockey. We'll do our autograph recap at the end of this, too. Box four. It's 
funny how a parlay can sour you on a player. It's like a group break. I know when when, uh, when people don't do well in a popular product, and they just don't do well in a number of breaks, they're like, man, this product sucks. <laughs> One parlay goes wrong, and man, it's like, man, Julius Randle sucks. <laughs> Even though he's just went healthy, a pretty solid player. It's kind of, I don't, I don't know how much load management Julius Randle's done, but like you kind of have to feel for Kawhi Leonard who has been load managed and all that. And in spite of all of their best efforts, you know, he tears his, tears a meniscus or something like that early round of the playoffs. And then that's that. You know, Paul George bends his knee back a couple weeks beforehand. That's that. I mean, which I think may be a good example of, hey, what's the point of load manage managing when you can you just get hurt at any time? Just got to live your life. Just go play the game and let the chips fall where they may. I mean, can't you load manage during a game? Does Kawhi have to play zero minutes? Can you not put him out there for 15, 20 minutes or so? Call that the load management? I mean, I do get the argument for load managing. You know, I think Greg Popovich kind of popularized that. But now I feel like, but I feel like you could argue that Pop was probably doing it for smart reasons because he's a very smart coach, and I feel like everyone just kind of ran with it, and it's kind of gone out, gotten out of control. <laughs> sort of a if you give a mouse a cookie situation. The Seattle Kraken has knocked out the Colorado Avalanche in the first round. First expansion team to win first playoff series against defending champions. I feel like there's a lot of qualifiers involved there, but nevertheless, it still stands. I don't know how many times an expansion team has gone to the playoff where they're facing the... First autograph of the box is Vaughn Brown, 58 out of 150. Going with a, uh, what, like a Vans shoe symbol right there, maybe a little division sign if you're in elementary school. That goes to the Giants, or sorry, that goes to Vaughn Brown, not the Giants. That's going to be for Neil Schumann. Is that right? A lot of NHL teams actually... And Vegas went to the... I guess Vegas did go to the finals in their first year. But they didn't lose. A lot of other teams that do? I guess... I feel like NHL expansion, whenever there's... They've had some expansion teams recently have been pretty generous with their expansion drafts. Is that part of the reason, Jason Jasper? All this, you know what, Mike Tower? This might be a little surprising to some people, but I have not seen that movie. I have not seen Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Here's Alejandro Osuna, Aqua Wave to 125. Hockey needs a three-point line, says Gilo. If you're gonna give him a three-point line in hockey? Wait, are you awarding three goals? Gilo? That's a lot. 
that would have to be on the goal line. If you shoot from the goal line on the other side, on the opposite side, you score a goal. Yeah, I don't think it's going to work, Jason. There's Jose Ramirez, pink, to 299. And we've got Manuel Beltre. And that will be for Jay Goins with that one. Any rule changes that should be made in hockey? I think it's hockey's like soccer. I feel like, or even like baseball, there's really shouldn't be too many fundamental room rule changes. I mean, really, the only major rule changes that have been tinkered with, I think overtime has been tinkered with a little bit. But fundamental parts of the game, there's Jace Bowen to 399 paper. I don't know if there's been a call for any changes there. No one says hockey games take too long. So no, I don't think there's any real fundamental, you know, or pace of play changes. Is there anything like that? I don't think so. Not to my knowledge. I mean... I've been watching, every year I've been trying to watch a little more hockey every season. And as a sort of, ca as a casual fan, there's nothing where I'm just like, oh, that's confusing, or I don't understand this, or, you know, like, I wish there, what's more of this, or that doesn't make sense, or, or any anytime I ask Jason about a question about a rule, it's always like, oh, that makes sense. There's no situation where I'm like, oh, that's just weird. There's nice Edward Julian, by the way, speckle autograph. He's, a, he's one of our key players we're looking for. 63 out of 299. Edward Julian goes to Neil. Neil Schoon with the Edward Julian Javier Baez combo. But there's never a moment where I see a weird rule, ask like someone about it or ask Jason about it, and I've never heard him go, well, it's just a weird quirk of the NHL or something like that. That's just the way it is. No one likes it, but there might be rules that exist, but none, none that I've really come across in my casual viewings where Jason's like, oh, that's a weird rule. That's just the way it is, you know? I wish they'd change it someday. I don't really hear anything like that. I mean, I think a sport like the NFL could stand to simplify a lot of rules it's Cole Young to 150. I feel like if you just... I mean, maybe growing up with it is a little different because you just you just kind of learn something every, every year of your life. But if you just took like... I don't know. Let's say you took someone... Probably the best example would be like... Someone who's watched just like soccer for the, their entire life. Never even seen a single snap of, of, of American football, right? And let's say they're, you know, 25, 30 years old or something like that, and that's all they've been watching, and that's all they're kind of... It's, I mean, it's kind of hard to explain. I mean, the fundamentals, I guess, are, are, are there, but... I mean, there's such a huge learning curve in terms of, like... Penalty. Think about all the penalties. There's false starts, there's offsides, there's... There's too many men along the scrimmage line. You can only have so many men there. You know, who's eligible? How come everyone's not able to catch a football? 
like they have to learn that. So those big guys up there, they can't catch it unless they tell them they're, they're eligible to catch it. You know, like pass interference rules, what's a catch rule? You know, you could, I feel like it could get pretty overwhelming for, for someone to kind of learn if they don't like, you know, as a child, you, I mean, you got hours to spend just learning the game, so it's, it's something different. But as an adult, it's, it's different to reinvest in the game. It's not as simple as soccer, per se. They were, so who's they, Eric Houston? They were saying today the timers in the MLB have increased the instance of IL. Hmm. Uh, yeah, I don't know. That, that, that's, that brings to mind one of my favorite games. Coincidence or correlation? You know, is there is there is it just a coincidence that's ha that's happened and people are just connecting dots, or is there actually correlation? I don't know if we'll really know uh, until until the until the end of the season. If you know, just to keep just to keep track of all the time changes, like what are pitchers being rushed to? To pitch the ball, like who's getting injured more? I don't. I don't see why hitters would get injured more. Just because of the clock, that doesn't make sense. I suppose pitchers could get injured because they're because they're rushing to pitch. But it, I don't think they're really being rushed. You know, if they were just like, if it was just like you pitch. The catcher catches the ball, whips it back, and they have to rock another pitch again. Like, if, if they kept doing that, I could see that. But if you look at the game, it's really not... It's really not... I, they don't seem like they're rushed. Like, I feel like they have plenty of time to get the ball back, get the signs, get into their routine, you know, set, wind up, and throw. Here's Juan uh, Serla, or Sorella. And Juan will go to Darren McKenzie. But ultimately, IL listings are up. I mean, let's take a look at some of the IL listings. Like, who's on the IL and why? And does it have to do with the pitch count? Or the pitch clock, not the pitch count, pitch clock. I would argue that it would be the bases. The, now, now that it's a little more inviting to steal a base, are more players attempting stolen bases, and are those players likely to end up on the IL? Players that normally don't steal too much? That's steal, but not that much. Are their number of steals up? And are also, are those the players that are landing on the IL with maybe like a tweaked hammy or a strained calf? You know, something, something random like that. But I don't see how it would affect the how, how the clock would affect pitchers or hitters. That is, it would mostly be pitching, if anything. There's a Marion Boy to three ninety nine, and there's Andy Pais. It's a big prospect for the Dodgers. And we have. We have Moises Ballesteros, 60 out of 75. This Cubs prospect going to Darren McKenzie. 
That is 60 out of 75. All these Justin Crawfords, by the way, are go to go to uh, Jim Jim Wei. That is Jim Wei Yin. Ooh, I feel something different on the back of my hand, ladies and gentlemen. It is the cool, cool feeling of a printing plate on the back of my index finger, where this card is resting. I feel the cool coolness of a plate. There it is. Is it autographed? You don't think so. Isn't there usually a numbered card, then the auto? Yeah. Not autoed, but a Juan Olmos plate. It was almost an autograph, but just not quite. Juan Olmos going to... It's for Craig McGinnis. Let's hope he becomes a superstar. Super Estrella, Juan Olmos. Craig, all aboard the Big Hit Express. Woo -woo. Any Matt Mervis yet? No, I've not seen a Matt Mervis. So an odd thing happens this game. Whit Merrifield returned to Kansas City a few weeks ago to a warm welcome. Stepped out of the box to tip his hat, and I think they called a pitch clock penalty on him. Uh, the, the pitch clock gave, the, they're not sentimental. They don't care about nostalgia or sentiment or anything like that. It's a cold, cold SOB. It doesn't care about former players returning. All right, we got a Yoan Hill Aponte, another Yoan Hill for, for Ed P. You know what? That, that's on the ump. Doesn't the ump start the clock? Who starts the clock? I think the ump starts the clock, right? I think I was just going to say, yeah, Oliver. I think Cody Bellinger got the same thing, too. I mean, the umpire should just be like, hey, we're going to not do the clock. Let's give this first. The ump should know. Umps are baseball fans. They should know. They know these players. They know the history. They're not idiots. I blame the ump, Gabe. The ump should have been like, listen, let's give Whit Merrifield time out. Let's give Whit Merrifield his, his time. You know, the ump can count off like 10 seconds in his head or something. And then start the clock and be like, hey, I'm starting the clock. Get in the box. Ump. Stupid ump. All right, three boxes to go. Pitch clock should never be an issue for most players. Don't think it used to be in the minors. Yeah, well, at least, when did, when did it start in the minors? Three, four years ago, maybe? So I guess anyone who was in the minor league system three or four years ago, probably. I don't think Whit Merrifield has ever dealt with a pitch clock in the minors, so. Well, I mean, that's a different story, but I mean, anyone who gets a violation. Like Manny Machado, Juan so like those. The guys who've been hit recently with those. So I want to say a vast majority of the players actually probably haven't dealt with a pitch clock, if you think about it. What's the average age of players in the in, in Major League Baseball? Maybe that's not a good metric. What's the average age of starters, of everyday starters in Major League Baseball? I mean, eventually, when all those players 
I guess, age out. Yeah, eventually, we're kind of in a transitional period. Once all those guys age out, then... Was it longer than... Yeah, look, someone looked that up. How long has the pitch clock been in the minors? I want to say it's within the last... I don't think it's as long as... It feels longer, but I don't think it's as long as we think. I don't think it's more than five. It might be four or five years. Is it more than that? All right, another box. Here we go. Good luck, everybody. Got a Carlos Jorge. Man, I love his use of the canvas here. It's strong. That's a player I'm rooting for. A player with a bold autograph. He must be a bold player. Carlos Jorge is for... Is for Brian Heyman. Refractor autograph, 17 out of 499. There you go, number 25 Reds prospect. According to Baseball America. Yeah, I don't know how how like the punishment of officials work in different on all the different leagues. There is some sort of there is some sort of evaluation system. You know what I mean? Because the only punitive thing that I know of is that is that if you don't grade out as well, you don't get um, you don't get postseason assignments, which is essentially like a bonus for good officials. Because so I think it's just more money, you know, for those playoff games. So if you're on a playoff, if you're part of the playoff team, you know, that's like an honor, you know, being rewarded for. So there is a an, an evaluation thing. They just don't roll out there, and but it's not public. The NBA kind of does something where. Or they will maybe say, yeah, we messed up on this call or that call, but for specific things. But NFL or NFL or uh, MLB definitely has not adopted that. I think that's a nice little feature that NBA officials do. But I think that's only from the, the officials' unions are pretty strong. So, you know, for obvious reasons, they don't want to put a lot of negative light on themselves. But, but yeah, I don't know. So I don't know what the punishment system is. That's never revealed, you know, by the player or the officials unions and you know, probably for obvious reasons, I don't think any officials want to get called out. So they've probably collectively bargained or whatever, saying that, yeah, we're not going <laughs> to, we're not, we don't have to. It's a private, it's a private organization. It's not, I don't think Major League Baseball really controls too much. Like in the way that I don't know if they could force the Major League Baseball umpires union to like, you know, to, to take accountability. I suppose they could... Michael Royal, by the way, goes to goes to Craig. So that's why. Yeah, for Angel Hernandez, Angel Hernandez has claimed like it's because of 
the color of my skin because of my last name, you know, if you get his drift. But I think the umpires union has kind of said, without calling him out, I think it's pretty much been like, yeah, we have an evaluation process and we use that to, uh, to, to determine who ends up in playoff games. <laughs> and it's not because we like you or not, which pretty much says it all. There's Gabriel Martinez to 125. There's Justin Crawford. Well, Rex, that goes into the goes into what is a reviewable play or not. That has also been collectively bargained and agreed upon. What plays are reviewable when? So there's that. There's Micah Bell to 150 Atomic. Now, the argument, of course, there's Zach Nito to 175. Um, that is, he got called up, too. That goes to Ed P. So... I guess the argument is, well, if you're going to have review cameras out there, let's have everything be reviewable, but everything is not reviewable. So there's complications there, too. Oh, NBA reviews are the worst. Yeah. I thought MLB reviews are bad, and they are pretty bad, but just especially for some reason this season, like... For, Maybe they've always been that bad, but for some reason, I've just it's just kind of needled me a little bit more. It just bugs me a little bit more this year, the way NBA reviews are taken. Like, there's been some complicated ones where I'm like, all right, yeah, I could, I could see why that would take some time. But I've seen some real obvious ones where they're still... There's Manuel Beltre, by the way. That's another one for, for Jay Goins. But, like, I'm, like, watching this. It's, like, it's real obvious. And they take, like, and the announcers say it's obvious. The crowd isn't, even if it's, like, an opposing crowd, they're not saying anything because they've seen it on the big screen. And they're just waiting. I don't know what they're waiting for. Is this a problem with the people who are looking at the review? Is, is it all sent to a central replay center? Why are they taking so long? You know, I feel like half the time, like, like someone went out to, someone out for a smoke break or something like that. Like one guy in the replay center goes out for a smoke break and then there's like a big red light beeping in the control room where it's like, we need a re replay assistant. All right, two boxes to go. And then someone comes inside from his or her smoke break, and they're like, oh, shoot. And they run to the thing. Wait, wait, what play am I? Where were you? Bob, where were you? I was out for a smoke break. Bob, we're in the middle of a game. You could do that afterwards. There's nothing was going on. Well, now something's going on. We've been waiting for like four minutes. Yeah, you can't review everything. I mean, you know, I feel like you almost have to be like, let's uh, let's review nothing and just have it the way it was before, or let's review everything. I I'm kind of getting to that point. And just be like, and just be like, listen, you know. You can review everything. I don't know how many reviews basketball gets now. Is it like two, one review? And then you keep, or one challenge, and you keep the challenge if it's successful?
Yeah, pivotal moment of the game. I mean, that gets a little, get, gets to be a little bit, I mean, I think they already kind of do review, there's Jonathan Mejia, Invicta, 57 out of 99. That is for Darren McKenzie and the mejia Xander bogarts combo. They kind of do that already, do they not? I feel like there are a few moments where in pivotal moments they're not reviewing. Uh, I don't know. I've heard people argue that every moment is pivotal, Rex. Let's say your your pitcher's in a your pitcher's in a bases loaded jam in the second inning. It's two outs, you know, and they could get out of this inning with one more out. But then there's that one play that happens that turns into an extra batter, which turns into a crooked number, blah, 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 blah. There's Colson Montgomery to 125. Bowman Scott's top 100 aqua at number 43 on the list. Colson Montgomery will go to Oliver. There's Martin Gonzalez to 199 for Seattle. Could be analysis paralysis, paralysis by analysis, however you want to say. Well, who's that early in the season? They had a really bad call and ended up being the last strike out of the game. Yeah, you, you can't review balls and strikes. So you're, right, you're saying moments like that, balls and strikes should be, you can review a ball and a strike. Now the argument is, is that in the bottom of the ninth, every pitch is pivotal. So are you saying you can review every pitch in the bottom of the ninth? There's uh, Myro Shendrick Martinez, 78 out of 100. Goes to Jay Goins, Dodgers prospect. I mean, if it's a blatant bad call that everyone knows is a bad call, but I like how often, I mean, I'm not trying to be, that's that, I'm just trying to explain, I'm just trying to illustrate just how tricky it could be. It's easy to say, well, just a bad call, but then how many bad calls? Is it every batter, every pitch in the bottom of the ninth? How much time are you willing to give up in a game to, to, to argue those? Because then at that point, you should just be like, well, let's just have, you know, let's just have an automatic ump. Let's have the computer say what a ball and strike is. That way there'll be never any, you know, you know, there'll never be a problem. Which I kind of wouldn't mind, by the way. <laughs> As the years go on, there's Jordan Diaz to 399. Like, I kind of think for balls and strikes, how much time do we waste arguing with our friends, talking with each other on the stream, while you're watching a game with your buddy? How many times are we arguing balls and strikes? It's all a waste of our time. Here's Matthew Wood. There's uh, Jim Way with Matthew Wood. Why not just balls and all balls and strikes? Just robo, and no one, uh, no one can argue with it. Let's just really dial in robo-umping, you know, that can adjust to different heights of players, different batting stances, all that sort of stuff, you know. Let's make it super high-end, super state-of-the-art. 
you know, not just what you see on TV today, but just let's just really make it some of the most amazing technology ever. Let's just put that out there. And humans can still decide, can still decide outs, you know, on the bases. Got a James Wood purple paper to 250. I mean, yeah, if we can have RoboCop, I know that wasn't a that was maybe a failed experiment, but I feel like I feel like if we have the technology to build RoboCop, we have the technology to build Robo. Um, why can't we just take the RoboCop technology and uh, and put it towards Robo Ump technology? There's Ariel Almonte, for fifty six out of four ninety nine. I mean, Eric Houston. I saw the same documentary, RoboCop. It's a good documentary. And we saw firsthand what RoboCop can do. Barry Roberts has Ariel Almonte. We watch the documentary. We see what RoboCop can do. Good and bad. Right. Amazing documentary, Eric's saying. So we know what RoboCop can do. Good and bad. We've seen the documentary. We've seen what, what, what it is. You know, maybe there are some issues with it. But... I think it has shown that we have the technology to build a robo ump. We need justice in the strike zone, ladies and gentlemen. We need justice in the strike zone. Are you in favor of taking humans out of referee action only in baseball or would you just from other sports? Just for balls and strikes in baseball. Or maybe just use more robo technology in in more black and white issues. You know what I mean? They do that with offsides. The offsides rule in soccer. They've got robo technology. They've got I don't know if it's robo technology. They, they, there's computer technology that'll that'll dictate, oh this guy's, you know, shoulder was off or was one foot was offsides. I feel like that's important for soccer. I feel balls and strikes are always such a such, such a hot, hotly debated thing, especially as fans when we can see when we can see a box on the screen and we can see where the pitches are landing inside the box. You know what I mean? When it gets to that kind of technology, like you know, there's a lot of like you know Monday morning umps, if you want to call it, is it couch umps? Couch umpires who are just like, that's not right. You know, like. Right, they use they, they use that Hawkeye technology in tennis. Are you telling me we can't use that for, for baseball? Just for balls and strikes, which is the thing that we seem to be debating the most over something that should be sort of clear and obvious. The blue line of scrimmage on that one is still not in it. Still inaccurate. Yeah, I gotta look into this Chilo, but I, I used to be outraged about the same thing. But someone, or like why there was an argument of like why first downs can't just be automated or something like that. Because I think ultimately the camera only accounts for where where they see the ball on the TV broadcast something like this it, there was some science involved that I that I didn't wrap my head around um, but I think on the field the refs and the side judges 
are co coordinating to exactly where the football is on the line of scrimmage. Let's say we're looking down the field here on this camera angle. So the end zone is back there, right? And so like, I think where they're putting it, they're lining it up with the side judges over here. And the camera, the camera that's looking down on the field on a football game. Yeah, I think there's perspective issues with that too, Mike. There's some that I'll have to look that up. There's Julio Rodriguez paper to 499. And cameras are placed in, it doesn't seem like it, but cameras are placed in different angles in different stadiums because they're, they're all built differently. So camera wells in one stadium will be at another part of the stadium. Which also complicates issues. There's Lazaro, uh, Lazaro Montes, 77 out of 125. That is the lunar parallel. Lunar aqua, maybe? Yeah, I'll have to look that up. There, or someone, some ESPN E60 should do a story in it, but there's Randy De Jesus. But pretty much, there's a reason why humans are still marking downs and ball positions and stuff like that. And why that chain gang still exists. But hey, I hear you, Gilo. We're about to send people to Mars, you know. And here we are figuring out, you know, not figuring out an accurate strike zone in the beloved game of baseball. That's un-American. If, if I went back in time and told Abraham Lincoln, President Lincoln, we still don't have an accurate way to figure out balls and strikes. Hi, I'm from 2023. We still have not figured out a way to, call, to accurately call balls and strikes. I mean, how disappointed would he be? He's like, I guided this country You know, <laughs> out of a civil war. Got his country through a civil war. And you're telling me we can't figure out balls and strikes? You'd be like, we have not advanced at all as a society. There's uh, Yenier Fernandez, 62 out of... 150, a little color match there. Blue chrome for the blue, for the boys in blue. Blue chrome, take two. Blue chrome for the boys in blue. That's going to go to Scott Goodman. Would Lincoln, oh Rex, would Lincoln know what baseball is? Open a history book, Rex. Open a history book, Rex. Actually, I don't know if he would or not, but early forms of baseball were played uh, in various Union and Confederate camps throughout the, uh, throughout the Civil War. Played a lot. Organized baseball as we know it probably didn't happen until much later, but many forms of baseball were happening during those times. One of the soldiers' favorite pastimes. But baseball, as we know, it probably wasn't until like, like, till Doubleday, organized all of it, codified some rules and figured some stuff out, late 1800s, 1890s maybe. So 
So I'm not entirely sure if out of 399 green paper. I don't know if uh, Lincoln, I'm sure Lincoln knew of baseball. Do you think Lincoln ever played baseball? That I don't think so. Would be my would be my argument, <laughs> Jason. Um, but uh, there's Randy De Jesus to 150, blue chrome for uh, for whoever has Randy De Jesus. Should be one more autograph here. But I mean, I would imagine that he's he's like de -de 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 telegraphing reports back and forth from all of his generals and stuff. There must have been a report coming across his desk saying, you know, the soldiers are are camped in for the winter, you know, if the weather is good, sometimes they're, you know, some of the, some of the soldiers are playing a little game of balls on bases or something like that. And there's Jacob Berry. Jacob Berry goes to our final autograph going to it's on the other page here. Going to David Harrell, big boys, 007. That's the Marlins' uh, first round pick, six overall. I've never seen The Ridiculous Six. Is that a documentary on baseball? Would Lincoln height frame? He'd probably yeah. He'd probably be. What, what's the what's Abraham Lincoln's official height? Abraham Lincoln. Height. He was six four. How much do you think he weighed? Like two fifteen. No. I mean. That's a that's I mean if Lincoln weighed 6'4, 215, woo, nah, he's probably 6'4, 190. That's a solid, that's a solid uh maybe a solid point guard height right there. In today's NBA anyway. I mean maybe back in the day, he's definitely a center back in the day, right, Mike Tower? No, I mean, look at you. Look at the pictures. He's super skinny. So can you find it online? Does anyone tell you like? No, I don't. I don't. I don't see weight. I see a lot of height. But, I mean, I don't know. But maybe they wore looser suits back then. You know, that seems like seems like he could be he could be hiding a lot of weight, unless he was just ripped. You know what I mean? You don't see Lincoln with his shirt off. If you pop that shirt off. Maybe we maybe he's just ripped zero percent body fat, and he's just jacked. I mean, he's got to slay vampires. Hey, I I read that biography. All right, that's random player break number one. We got another one in the store if you want to get it going. Sometimes during these long breaks, yeah, we we get sidetracked a little bit. We like to have fun here, folks. So thanks for watching. Thanks for breaking with us. I'm Joe for JaspiesCaseBreaks.com. That was a nice hit. Thanks for watching. Thanks for breaking with us. I'll see you next time for the next one. Bye-bye.